This week's episode of Quality Irrelevant is brought to you by Uncle Jimmy's homemade intercontinental ballistic missiles. What could be better at the end of a hot summer's day than sitting on your porch, watching the sun go down and cracking open an ice-cold intercontinental ballistic missile homemade by good old Uncle Jimmy himself? When you invite the guys round to watch the big game, what better accompaniment could there be to good friends and great times than Uncle Uncle Jimmy's homemade intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uncle Jimmy's homemade intercontinental ballistic missiles. Welcome home. Um, I will point out now that we had quite a lot of potential sponsors this week. There's a chance I might have mixed two different ad reads up there. No, really? But I, I'm just going to go with it because we might get two for the price of one. That sounded so cohesive, though. I also like the way you read out the entire brand name again and again and again to really hammer it home. Yeah, I just thought repetition is the key to marketing. That's probably a thing, right? Damn right. And not honest in any single way and on the subject of not being honest I have to say I've trialed the product I think it's quite good I can guarantee that all the nuclear material inside is indeed homemade yeah so you know it's unstable extremely refreshing Mm. I have come in from a hard day's work in the fields and uh, chug down a good old Uncle Jimmy's homemade intercontinental ballistic missile and just felt a lot better about life. And had a lot less flesh on your body after that. You take the good and the bad together with Uncle Jimmy's homemade intercontinental ballistic missiles. Well, I'm glad that they are our sponsor this week because I think that it is thematically cohesive. Oh, um, if it's thematically cohesive, I I would like you to cut that out, please. Oh, uh, okay. (coughs) We will start again. Again. Uh, well, that was completely not cohesive with what is going on this week. Because do you know what week it is, Phil? Uh, d- uh no. It is the experiment week. Oh, dear. Sweet Jesus. I know. So I feel like that as the gruelling weeks have dragged on, I sense that on occasion your enthusiasm for this podcast that was once so bright and wild uh, has sort of waned slightly. But I'm going to bring that back round because this week is all about experience. Experiments. I like experiments, especially when they have explosions in them. So, right, this week I want a good podcast, no funny business. Uh, you know, we're going to shake hands at the beginning, no punches below the belt. It's going to be a good one, okay? If you say it, it will be so. Well, that, mm, well, we may come on to that. <laughs> uh, so, it is the week of experiments. Phil, who have you been experimenting on? Uh, I found the remains of my radioactive hamster. Yeah. It was not pleasant. How do you feel about that coming across the remains of an old friend? Uh, I feel a lack of compassion <clears throat> in my life in general, so it didn't really affect... I'm worried that I might be a sociopath mm. because looking at the dead, radiation-scarred remains of my former best and only friend, I felt literally nothing. Well, are you sure it was actually the remains of your friend and not just like, I don't know, a collection of pocket lint or something? I'm pretty sure I was back in the bunker because I thought that I might be able to sort of revive the hamster by sewing its head onto the body of, I don't know, a tortoise, perhaps. Didn't work. How did you get back into the bunker, though? Has the sewage drained yet? No, I had to get a portable laser of sorts, uh, like a mining laser (laughs) that are things that have definitely been invented and weren't just from the TV show Red Dwarf Yeah, and sort of tunnelled through the sewage in order to get back to my laboratory which I don't remember if it was a laboratory before or if it was just a bunker but I was back in there doing my experiments preparing for this week's podcast in the best way that I know how which is mutilating the remains of a radioactive Kobe hamster yeah did you get the head on the turtle the turtles the tur the toitus the the turtle uh the turtle in the end um are you from everywhere uh it sounds like it, right? No, I didn't. The tortoise ironically was too quick for me. 
Wow. Couldn't get hold of it. They're slippery bastards are those tortoises. Well, they are in those fables. Yep. There's something to be learned if there's a moral of some sort. It's that if you turn your back for even a second, a tortoise will have his way with your wife and burn your house down. Yeah. Um, I have to admit the uh, brain fart I experienced about a minute ago was because as soon as you said tortoise, I thought of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles again, specifically the millennial cartoon that came out some years ago now which was extreme in every way so I'm pretty sure that the theme tune rather than being sort of light hearted and very 80s it just shouted the word turtles over and over and over again so it just went turtles 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 I'm guessing over some kind of extremely aggressive dubstep backing yeah it wore kind of yeah mixed with new metal I think and sorry when you mentioned that that's just what popped into my head and now I just have a voice in my head going turtles Turtles! <laughs> over and over again. I'm not really sure what else is new. Well, no, but I thought I should let you know so you can write it down, and then if anything changes over time, like my cognitive abilities seems to deteriorate or enhance, then that means something, right? Because that's what we do with an experiment. You, you come to a conclusion. No, wait, you have your conclusion, and then you do the experiment, and then you find out if you're wrong. Science! Anyway, so is your hamster back with us, nice and alive? I bet, running in back in his hamster wheel, arm bones intact. Uh, no, there was an incident. Oh. Does he now just resemble, like, a um, barbecue sauce stain? More salsa. Ah, chunks. Chunky salsa. Mmm, well, that's good. Well, I am glad you are back in your bunker, because it sounds like you're doing the proper science, the real science. You're in the lab, you're like, in my mind's eye, I see, like, different coloured liquids in test tubes and beakers, and some of them are smoking. And I have those weird, like, glass tubes that have lightning in them somehow. The Tesla coil, I believe. And do you have those mad scientist goggles on your head with the big yellow anti-radiation gloves? Always. Every single week that we've done this podcast, that is how I've been dressed. I thought that came across in my voice. We're possibly not the most qualified to be doing science, I feel. But, as I have stated before, that shall not stop us, because I have also been doing real science, but contrary to the kind of science that you have been doing, which I, again, imagine involves pouring one smoky liquid into a beaker with another liquid in there and then pouring those into two different test tubes and then shaking them and see which ones like blows up. Yeah and opening my skylight which is a bad idea when you're buried in sewage but uh, trying to get some lightning from the thunderstorm. Even though I have lightning in a tube you'd need that fresh stuff for the magical science potion to work. It is a bit of a cliche but it is nice that whenever our generation thinks of science, we always default to the reanimation of bodies of some kind, using lightning and the elements. Yep, and presumably some kind of body snatching previously. Grave robbing. Well, we do have all those popular images in our minds of, you know, the funny grave robber who is a bit sort of bedraggled and everything. You don't really think about what they're doing, it's just like a funny old-timey role. It's not so much of a problem now, we hope. Yeah, it's like chimney sweep or paper boy. They just don't really exist anymore, but you remember them fondly. All those cheeky grave diggers going, oh, hello, sir. I have got a leg in my hand. Oh, I'm imagining one now with a top hat, but the top of it is like open like a tin can. So it's not like a smart top hat. It's one of those like battered and old sort of with the flappy top on there. And they've got dirty, dirty faces, soil in their ears and stuff. And they're like carrying a shovel around and going like, here, we've not been doing no grave robin. I don't know where that man was from. He's from all. All of history. Okay. Just from the past, you know. Sorry, I just like to get some kind of context in my mind when you talk about these things. And like with the chimney sweep, when we think of the chimney sweep, we just have the idea of in our mind of a little rascal who's like covered in soot and has like a big brush, is whistling as he, you know, skips along there. We don't actually think of the twisted broken limbs and the deaths and the claustrophobia and the lung problems and the tuberculosis and the dying before you're 12 and all those sorts of nasty, unfun kind of things that are associated with it. No, we like cheeky, fun grave robbers and alive chimney sweeps. 
Those are our favourite types of people. So you embody the classical mad scientist type who's in his lab, he's a bit of a recluse, you know, you've got the Jekyll nature to you there, the Frankenstein, slightly crazed, probably been snorting a bit too much of his chemicals that are meant to be used for experimentation only, but you've sort of got a bit of a liking for them now. Whereas I am the modern scientist. I am out with the people, I am dressed quite smart, I am charismatic, I talk to people, you know, I'm not just in the lab, I'm on the streets. I assume you have some kind of tablet computer. Exactly, exactly, that I'm diligently making notes and analyses in and taking pictures of things at a jaunty angle and whatnot, and uh, I'm talking to people, I'm getting involved with people's lives, I'm crawling in to their abodes and moving things around and displacing things and seeing what effect that has. You know, I'm in the human sciences here, the humanities, the social sciences. I'm experimenting with people's minds, and I don't mean like you, where you've probably just got like a, you know, a big brain in a bucket somewhere and you're electrocuting it a lot and there's smoke all coming out. No, I am just warping people's perception of the world, what they think is real, and just writing down what I think that means on my tablet, on my iPad that a university paid for. For someone else, but then it, it came into my possession through um, uh, theft. I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. I was electrocuting my bucket brain. Oh yeah, how is that brain doing? Has it turned yet? Mm, difficult to tell. It doesn't seem to like being electrocuted, but I think that you can't get true results without causing a living thing incredible pain. Is it human or monkey? Uh, could be either. What, a bit of column A, bit of column B? Maybe you should throw some some shark in there as well. Well, it's less sort of a singular brain in a bucket as it is a bucket of brain. Oh, okay. Is that there are multiple brains or it's now just more of a soup? There were so many different types of brain in there that it has sort of turned into a soup. That wasn't the intention when I established the brain bucket, but it sort of does just happened of its own accord. I have a bucket of brain soup. So I'm going to write that down as an episode title. Yeah, by some measure, you have created life. You have created something. Well, you've taken one thing that presumably had died and is now turning itself into soup. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if I put some eyeballs in there, then it might start looking at me. Yeah, and uh, I imagine there'll be a lot of fear in those eyes. Don't we all fear our creators? I suppose we do. I'm terrified of my dad. <laughs> yeah, well, at least you're not scared that, you know, your creator may drink from the bucket which you currently occupy. There's many reasons for that. I don't live in a bucket is one. That's sort of the major one. But that brain soup, I bet, is really tempting. Well, I, I am sort of constantly afraid that my dad is going to electrocute me. And eat you. I feel like that would be an afterthought more than anything. He might eat me, but that would never be his intention when he started out electrocuting me. Well, if you have this complex, this brain complex syndrome that I have diagnosed in you, and I hope you don't mind me diagnosing you, I mean as a fellow doctor, because obviously we both have our doctorates, you know, we are fully licensed to practice, but I just want your permission to be my patient as well as my fellow doctor. Doctor of Medicine Science. Well, considering that I have filing cabinets full of notes about your conditions, it would be churlish of me to decline, to deny you the privilege of getting inside my brain. Quite. And so, you may have an interest in an experiment that I have been conducting. You remember my spider dungeon, correct? I do. Well, I am still there, but I am now in the building itself. I've sort of crept up onto the higher floors. I'm now creeping around in the walls and the stairwells and the places I'm not really meant to be in the ceilings and stuff. I found loads of secret hatches and doors and things. It's uh, great. I can sort of like scrabble up. You know in the Matrix and that bit where they're in the walls and they sort of fall down into the basement? I've kind of done the opposite of that. I've kind of managed to scrabble up through a wall and get to every level of the building above me. It's great. So I can sort of like pick 
appearing, all the families and all the people who live here, and get lots and lots of good science notes, is what I'm calling it. So you are essentially recording the podcast from inside the drywall. Exactly, exactly. And that's going to be the title of my new book. Inside the Drywall. (laughs) With Theo. (laughs) Dr. Theo. Dr. Theo. And it's just a picture of you. Yeah. Your head rammed out of a wall. (laughs) Covered in dust and plaster. Looking absolutely insane. (laughs) Yeah. It's going to be great. Anyway, I have a family that I've been working on for quite some time, right? And in this experiment, well, I will tell you the premise. Premise? Hypothesis. Hypothesis. My hypothesis is what would happen if the father of the family the patriarch was a baby it's an interesting hypothesis so i've got a nuclear family you know your standard you know 2.41 kids or whatever wife uh sorry we've had to go traditionalist with this but the father is a baby a three month old to be precise is he the biological father because i if so i have many questions oh yes as i say we've had to go the traditional route we've gone with the nuclear family the sort of the reagan era idea of the family unit which doesn't necessarily fit with my modern scientific ideas and image that i've put out for myself but you've got to start with a baseline so yes uh, the father is the biological parent of uh the 2.4 kids married to the of course do you have any photos of the ceremony because i would love to see those i have swiped a few uh from before my intervention into the household but unfortunately there's a doctor experimenty privileges you understand so i'll email them you but i'm not gonna put them out there on the uh, podcast but um yeah yeah they seemed quite happy together before uh this experiment began i have to say are they not happy now there are hardships there are hardships but are Aren't there hardships in every relationship, regardless of whether you are a baby? Well, exactly. Of course, of course. And I am hoping to use this to promote a new idea of the family unit. You know, do the parents have to be adults? Did you want an answer from me? Because it's your experiment. Well, I don't expect one, Phil. It is my research. And if you take my answer from me, I will fucking hunt you down and plagiarize the fuck out of you can you plagiarize the fuck out of a bucket of brains well i'll give it a damn good go sorry phil that wasn't meant to be a threat i just this is my impression of scientists sort of boiling to the surface i think that's what they do they just litigate the crap out of each other and complain and bitch and steal i think that's how it works i think that's why we don't have a cure for the common cold yet i think that must be it and you'll be interested to hear that in flat 4b we have a cure for the common cold which i've been working on it's gone down very very well on the patients i have occupying that flat right now is it a bullet to the head because i'm not sure that counts uh that is what we sort of call the final step of the experiment the final solution (laughs) Uh, that's a different book, Phil. Oh, I think sorry. you're getting confused. That one uh, isn't going to be released for some time. I'm still working on that one. But no, 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 no. This is a cure for the common cold. Side effects include slight headache, runny nose, uh, weepy eyes, feeling kind of tired and down, wanting to go to bed, not really wanting to go to work. But other than those, other than those few initial side effects, results are very promising. That's encouraging because previously, like the only cures for the common cold resulted in your mouth being full of worms and your body just decaying because you were dead from a cold because this was the past and you've been shoved up a chimney well (laughs) i don't know what that tangent was i'm sorry (laughs) i suppose that that would be one way to get rid of a body (laughs) shove it up a chimney (laughs) i am now sort of somewhat convinced that people in the past just lived in chimneys (laughs) because they're always up there so you never know you might be right You might be right. So we have the father is a baby. We have the cure for the common cold. We have electric floor floor. It's the floor where there's just electric floor. I have to admit that was, I may have stolen some of your research there. Mother, okay, fine. 
I'll find something to plagiarise you on. I have to admit, it wasn't intentional because I was climbing through the wall and I just, I encountered these long, plasticky, hose-like things that were filled with copper and metal of some sort. So I just had to, like, hack those out of the way. And then I came across, again, this other sort of pole-type structure that was filled with some kind of liquid. Again, I had to, like, kick that out and they sort of, like, bust through the drywall at the same time and, like, hit the floor. Then there was this loud flashing and then everything stopped and went very still and all the lights went out it was really weird and there was just a smell of like burnt hair and like sweet sticky sickly kind of smell so that experiment has gone great as far as i'm concerned because i've not heard a peep out of that entire floor since then well that's the goal of any experiment really right yeah so that one i'm putting down a success baby father mild success and cure for common cold pending more bullets i think the experiment house is a moderate success I am moderately impressed as a fellow scientist. Now, I have a couple of pitches for you, Phil. Okay. As far as experiments go, what do you think about these? Because I think you specialise in this. In fact, I'm already glad for the experiment you already mentioned, because this will be right up your street, I think. Your, Your line of research. Cheese soup. Cheese soup. Cheese soup. Can you expand a little bit on the details for me? Oh, yes, of course. Right. You know cheese. Curdled milk that has come out of a cow. I am aware of such a thing. Right. Are you aware of soup? Mm, Less so, but still familiar. Yeah, with no brains in it. Just without the brain. So just a bucket. Yeah, okay. Imagine the bucket. Okay. But instead of a brain floating in soup, it's just cheese. So it's a cheese bucket. It is cheese bucket. And I know where you're going to go with this, right? I'm a aware of cheese sauce, okay? I am aware of melted cheese. This is cheese soup. Is it sort of as if you made soup, but instead of say, water or some kind of stock, mm. you just use cheese? Yeah, with maybe a bit of water. A little bit, just so it's just cheese and water. <laughs> well, it's less impressive when you say it like that. I mean, the ratios and quantities are, are everything in soup. Yeah. Particularly when it is made of cheese. Right, okay. Imagine you're in a supermarket, right, or a grocery store, and you get to the soup aisle, right? You know, you got your tomato soup, you got your minestrone, you got your butternut squash and carrot and coriander soup, you got your mushroom soup, you got your chicken soup, you got your chicken and mushroom soup, you got your piss water soup, you got your grave soil soup. You've got your brain soup. That's my favourite one. But you got your alphabet spaghetti soup. But there's no cheese soup, is there, right? That cheese soup? I don't think so. Who has heard of such a thing? Imagine at the end there's a display with pots and pots of a yellow soup thing and it says on the front of it cheese soup question mark yes please well i think maybe less so than like a scientific discovery what you found is a gap in the market i have to admit this is science we can sell yes because everything comes in cheese flavor at some point i have had cheese popcorn i have had cheese crisps i have had cheese pizza i have had cheese on toast so cheese sandwiches it kind of makes sense that soup is so sort of ubiquitous in the supermarket and in the world of food but there doesn't seem to be such a thing as cheese soup and i think you have found something there that is new is innovative uh although having googled it i have found many recipes for cheese soup shit so i've lost my funding oh my grant is gone yeah might be some copyright issues here and there maybe i mean i have to admit you are right to call me out i know that as a humanitarian doctor and scientist man that you experiment on the human brain for the elevation of the species. Also fun. Also fun. You enjoy your work. There's nothing wrong with that. Whereas there is a brand of science or a type of science which is very much in terms of making profit and money and it is often viewed with a sort of, mm, it's considered sometimes a little bit insidious, you know, sort of like science for hire, almost like mercenaries and stuff. And you're like, mm, what are you doing there? You know, scientists that work for 
big tobacco or big cottage cheese. You know, what are they really up to? They've just got the interests of the corporations in mind. What's really going on there? But I thought cheese soup was a legitimate idea that we could sell. Now, I'm just going to bash through the next few because I think we actually had some real stuff prepared and this really isn't <laughs> anything at this point. So... Next one, fruit soup. You're going along a very similar line there, and I appreciate your consistency. I think fruit soup is less of a hit than cheese soup. I think you're filling less of a gap in the market. It's not a smoothie. It's hot. It's a hot smoothie. (laughs) Hot smoothie. Okay, scratch that. Hot smoothie. I would like to invest every single penny that I have in your idea, please. Brilliant. Success. Right. Hot smoothie. Okay, that is one idea. Down. Right. Teeth cereal. As in, so you get a box and you pour it out into a bowl and it is just teeth. Yeah. And then you put milk on them. Can do, yeah, or water. Some people have their cereal with water. Those people are insane. I know, I don't regard them. I was going to experiment on a bunch of them, but I just set fire to the cage. That's just better for everyone involved, I think. So my concern with teeth cereal, are teeth as hard as other teeth? Is it going to break people trying to eat this cereal that is made of teeth? I suppose you could make the teeth out of edible cereal products, like wheats and grains and such. I feel like you lose something in doing that. Yeah... Okay, if you had enough milk, you could probably just drink it down. What you could do is you could substitute milk for some kind of fizzy drink because those are known to dissolve teeth, so they might just soften them up a bit. Like Dr. Pib. Yeah, Dr. Pib. Yeah, or Mr. Tab. Yeah, or Fanta. (laughs) Is Fanta a British thing? I don't know. I don't know either. Is Tango a British thing? I think they have Fanta in that America. In that America. Is it called something else, like Orangina or something? It's probably called, like, Orange Flan. Or Orange Dew or Splat. Yeah. So teeth cereal is not going to go down so well unless we sell it with, like, a bottle of Coke. Yeah, I think that's the only way that you can really market teeth cereal. So those are my experiments for this week, and I hope they inform the rest of the show no they won't now i don't know what that was i think we kind of did the quandaries first which is fine we don't need to get bogged down in a set structure where we have to do everything in order i mean we're scientists phil we don't have structures and rules and methodologies we are scientists and at the same time we are agents of chaos chaos sciences that a thing probably yeah like I, it's like next to the mad sciences you got your mad sciences the chaos sciences and the food sciences i think chaos sciences are more to do with summoning dark entities from before the universe i'm not so much into that as i am electrocuting brains but each to their own ah, i suppose so We can now move on. We can. I realise that we completely didn't acknowledge recriminations and sentiments of any kind. Do you even have any? I have two. I also have two. That's weird. Yeah. I don't know whether they're recriminations or sentiments, though, so... Oh, I can definitely say that mine are 100% recriminations. Okay, then I feel that you should go first. So these are recriminations. They're about something specific that we talked about. They're sort of reactionary to something we have discussed in recent weeks. And I'm going to kind of go against form here, because we are agents of chaos. And I'm going to actually tell you who wrote these in holy shit because they're recognizable names i think okay like james brown well the first one is from someone called david blaine (laughs) that's not a real person well he says speaking on behalf of magicians everywhere you muggles can go die isn't that wizard talk i think so we did talk about magicians a lot at one point oh shit are we being sued i don't know there was no legal element to his recrimination. Well, Fel, I mean, this isn't a popular opinion, but there is a cabal of, like, evil magicians that are sort of at the centre of things and control all of the world. So, you know, we might have pissed off some powerful people here. That's a risk I'm willing to take for the sake of 
I was going to say art, but not art. Whatever the fuck this is. Science! Science! I'm doing it for the love of science. So there is another one. It's a bit longer, it's a bit more in-depth. We all hate you so much that we're going to trick you into watching us be smug and self-satisfied for 115 mostly content and entertainment-free minutes under the pretense that we were going to make some kind of logical sense instead of being part of an unbearably arrogant exercise in blurring the line between sleight of hand and actual real-life fucking magic which only appeals to the brain-dead personality vacuums who for some unknown and inscrutable reason voted it as favourite thriller movie at the 2014 People's Choice Awards. That is from every single character in the movie Now You See Me. So in many ways that was a recrimination and a movie review in one. Oh, that film! Yeah. Ah, I've not seen it. I disliked it. You may have been able to tell. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't... I mean, they wrote that, not me. Yeah, they wrote that. They didn't like it. No, they didn't like themselves for what they did to me. Yeah, fuck the magicians. Yeah, fuck them all. I mean, what the fuck are they going to do? Escape from a cabinet or something that's all chained up and underwater? Oh, are they going to, like, go inside a box and get a knife through them? Yeah, are they going to, like, do the thing where they offer you a handkerchief and then you pull it and then, like, loads of them all come out all tied up? Are they going to go in a hat and pull out a, a bunny? I can't remember what bullshit reasons we came up with for hating on magicians. No, I feel like we may have run out of steam on the magician racism thing, because we're clearly struggling now. What, that we're not actual hateful people? Yeah, it's difficult to be hateful when you like a lot of people. Yeah, especially now I'm looking at the Now You See Me film, it has uh, some people I like in it. Mark Ruffalo. Yeah, it's a bad film. Michael Caine. It is a bad film though. Morgan Freeman. It's Yeah, it's bad though. It's really bad. Uh. Well, they go, oh, look, we are illusionists, but then they do actual magic. Like sorcerers. Like actual impossible things. What? They jump off a building and all turn into money. What, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I kind of want to see that film now. It's so bad. <laughs> what do they turn into money? What does that mean? I'm a scientist, Phil. I need to know what that means. They like disintegrate into pound notes or something. Dollar notes. <laughs> That's not a trick. And then they're like over a crowd and all the crowd go, ooh, money. But it's at all actually bits of magician. What? But, <laughs> but no, they can't just... You can't do it. That's not a film. Fuck you, magicians, for that bit where you can just turn into money <laughs> and feel like you don't have to explain it. But they don't. They go on about like, ooh, we are illusionists. They're not illusionists. They're actual wizards. Do they acknowledge this fact? No, I know. Do they acknowledge they have supernatural prowess, which offend me this week because I'm a scientist and only believe in what I can empirically test? And or theorise or, you know, come up with some really out there, clever sounding, but kind of also worrying theories about the cosmos. I wasn't really listening. I'm watching the trailer for Now You See Me just to try and remind myself. They have like magic science machines as well that make people disappear. I don't, what? No, you can't. What? <laughs> no! Th- Ah. I'm pretty sure there's a sequel coming out. There's a trailer for it and Jesse Eisenberg stops rain in midair. Because he's Dumbledops from the... Oh, has it got... Da- it's got Daniel Radcliffe in it. The second one, yeah. That would make sense because he is a real wizard. Because he is a Harry Potter. We're literally just talking about no you see. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, fuck it. I need to get back on track. Okay. I'm going to stop watching that trailer now. <laughs> yeah, fuck those guys. They turn into money at me. I'm going to spend them. Yeah. So... I'll spend them so fucking hard exactly uh right i have some sentiments i think because at least one of these is positive again these are from anonymous because i'm not reading out your fucking names because you don't deserve a platform the first one simply says i like the phil one he is the prettiest i mean that's just that's team phil right there yeah that's just a fact you've got a fan i'm not really sure that can be counted as a sentiment seeing as that's just an empirical fact Mm. 
Okay, well, I blocked them, of course, because Obviously. Uh, I don't want their sort round here. And then the final one is just poo comes out brown. Again, empirical fact. Did you block them? No, I kept him around because I thought that was a good scientific statement right there. Stating facts. That's what we like, as opposed to the fucking magicians who can just become money for some reason. Let's not get into that, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but they're calling it like they see it, like scientists do. You know, they're explaining the natural world around them. They're explaining phenomenon around us. Phenomenon. Phenomen... Ph- Phenomenanon. Phenomen... <laughs> Phenomena. Is that it? Might be phenomena. Phenomenania. Phenomena. Phenomena. Yeah, they're explaining phenomena with empirical statements, you know, things you can analyse and attest to. They do like the Phil one. Poo is brown when it comes out. Seeing as we are scientists this week, I think it is right that we accept both of those. Holy shit, now you see me has Elias Cotiers in it, <laughs> who is known as, who is, he's like Casey Jones from the Turtle films. <laughs> and, he, and he was the man, the male actor in the one about the angels. And he was he had like had half a face or something in Shutter Island oh yeah the man with half a face is his character name oh something like that okay right I'm gonna cut it off there I'm gonna play the music (laughs) (laughs) I made the music for this right I don't know how it goes it's like I can't do my own music I thought if you write music you know what it is turns out that's bullshit you just like hit buttons and sound comes out that's how music happens like no one who has ever done any music is talented talented in any way you just mash your face against some buttons and then some noise comes out and that is music i mean i think as a music scientist phil you can attest to that i can and i just have a mutual disdain for all music yeah i mean what are you just practice something again and again until you got really good at it it's just arrogant yeah you just did the same thing again and again and again again. if i did that i'd be as good but i haven't so yeah if i wanted to i could practice over and over again and then i could turn into money as well exactly just try really hard but i just don't because it's just showing off fucking money we need to get off this (laughs) fucking film how about this right i'm gonna crack out my film review okay is it jurassic park yep spoilers and then we'll have a general conversation because i also have something coming up which we have to do this week so let's see if we can get through this as quickly as we can right okay and i didn't want it to be like i do two things at once because then your brain will pour out of your eye sockets if you listen to me for that long you say that like it isn't already add it to the soup and i'll get by later and chuck an onion in or something right i'm reviewing jurassic park i'm finally doing it this week it's been seven weeks till I'm doing it now because it is on topic, sort of, because they're doing... The science makes... It grows a dinosaur. So that is how that works. So it's the magic... Oh, and moving on. We don't have time for your film review, so we're moving on to the next section. (laughs) I I am just joking. You can do it if you want. Okay, so... Jurassic Park. The film is set predominantly on a remote island where a wealthy philanthropist has created a theme park filled with genetically cloned dinosaurs. When concerns for the safety of the public arise, a small team of experts travel to the island to evaluate the park and witness the marvels of the resurrected prehistoric life forms that once roamed the earth. Amongst these experts is the paleontologist Dr. Alan Grant, played by Sam Neill. When we are first introduced to him, Sam Neill demonstrates both admiration and trepidation towards Mother Nature when describing the hunting patterns of velociraptors. Sam Neill spies a young boy amongst the group he is teaching and decides to threaten him with a large raptor claw. While intimidating the child, Sam Neill proclaims the boy should be gutted and eaten by dinosaurs if Sam Neill had his way, as he slashes at the air with a claw to prove his point. Laura Dern is also there, and while she is visibly disturbed, she is too afraid to stand up to Sam Neill. In secret, she later confesses she is relieved that Sam Neill didn't pull a gun on the child, an act for which he is known. Under the Montana state law, the state in which these crimes occur, child abuse can be characterized as injury to the psychological capacity or the emotional stability of the child as evidenced by an observable or substantial change in behavior, emotional response, or cognition. And injury as evidenced by anxiety, depression, withdrawal, or aggressive behavior. Unfortunately, Sam Neill 
has knowingly usurped the legal system by exploiting an unforeseen loophole present in the Montana state law at the time that requires the majority of these acts to occur within the child's own home in order for Sam Neill to be prosecuted by a court. But since this child has been seemingly abandoned by his legal guardians in his unspecified dig site out in the Montana Badlands, Sam Neill has free reign to menace and harrow whoever he likes. From these events, I think it is fair to say that Sam Neill is a bad man. He shouldn't be allowed to do this. The movie industry as a whole should boycott Sam Neill from appearing in any other films, especially those which have children in them. How do you like that, Sam Neill? Do you feel like a big man now, Sam Neill? Are you gonna go and threaten another child, Sam Neill? Does that make you happy, Sam Neill? I saw you beat up that teenage Chinese sex worker in Peaky Blinders. You're a monster, Sam Neill. We all saw you rip your own eyes out in Event Horizon. What you do that for? You're a fucking madman. Oh, and he electrocuted that other boy in Jurassic Park. That happens later on and all. We all saw him do it. He gives him a big sloppy kiss on the mouth when the boy was unconscious. Don't give me that CPR bollocks. You're only supposed to do the chest compressions now. You only put your tongue down their throat when they're drowned. Come on, Sam Neill. You can't hide from this any longer. Come on, come back to the UK. I'll, I'll take care of you. It'll be fine. We'll put you in a padded cell or something. It'll only be a danger to yourself. It'll be fine. Oh, and he bit Ethan Hawke the once on the neck and all. We all saw you do it, Sam Neill. Come on, come back home. It'll be all right. Anyway, so yeah, uh, good film, Jurassic Park, eight stars out of five. Did you know Sam Neill is, uh, I think, from New Zealand? Shit, really? I think so. I think I read that and was surprised recently. Northern Ireland-born New Zealand actor. Holy shit! So he's from everywhere, and his actual name is Nigel. What? What other secrets does Sam Neill contain within? I remember watching Sam Neill in a TV movie where he played Merlin. I don't like the sound of that. More magician talk. It came out in 1998. So I was under 10 at that point. I remember watching it and I remember there being a lot of sex in that film. Ugh. Like everyone's just banging each other. Does Merlin get his end away? Lena Headey is in it Ooh. as Guinevere. He's scary. Yeah. And Helena Bonham Carter is in it and she has sex with King Arthur. What is this film? It's just called Merlin. What? Um... But Sam Neill is Merlin. What? Why is that? Oh, Sam Neill's a bad man. Yeah. You're a bad man, Sam Neill. What are you doing? I'm pretty sure at some point he was, like, watching people bang as well. What are you doing watching Lena Headey and King Arthur have sex? You, you're weird. I think he was watching Lena Headey and Lancelot, who I'm looking, was played by a guy called Jeremy Sheffield, who I vaguely recognise. But he was, like, watching them bang and going, like, Oh, I've made a terrible mistake. Because he came too soon. Dirty Merlin. Dirty, dirty Merlin. So, yeah, Sam Neill is a terrible person. I'm looking at the synopsis from Merlin. It goes on for fucking ages. It was three hours long. <laughs> three hours of Sam Neill's Merlin. They did a sequel as well that had, like, nothing to do with it. You know, for a podcast about science, we are talking about magic quite a lot. I suppose magic is the enemy of science. I feel like we are talking about it in a snarky and sarcastic manner, which is befitting of two scientists. That does make sense. We're talking down about Merlin. Yeah. Fairies. What is that? And Lena Headey, who I uh, quite like. Yeah. What's she doing around Sam Neill? See, Sam Neill corrupts. Oh, Martin Short was in that film as well. <laughs> he played a gnome. <laughs> called Frick. No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. <laughs> no, he didn't. Shut up. Shit, Rutger Howell was in this movie. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is this movie? I don't want to watch this. One, I abhor all magic of all kinds this week. And also, it's got Sam Neill, the worst man alive in it. <laughs> he is a terrible human being. He shouldn't be near gnomes. <laughs> He shouldn't be. He's not allowed. He's he's done things. Have you seen him in the Peaky Blinders? Does he do stuff to gnomes? Well, no, no but he, like, he harasses the local folk. Are any of them gnomes? Well, there may have been a gnome in there somewhere. I can't quite tell. Oh, then he shouldn't be allowed near gnomes. If he's got previous. And he bit Ethan Hawke yeah. on the neck. What is Ethan Hawke? We've had this discussion. Let's not get into it. I think I need to add a topic to the list about Ethan Hawke because we need to revisit visit that grave. Yeah. We didn't kill Ethan Hawke and bury his body. No, we tried. I mean, that brain you're experimenting on, we've not named yet, so... No, I mean, I call it Ethan Hawke, but it's not actually Ethan Hawke's brain. <laughs> 
No. Ethan Hawke is alive and well and totally did not get his throat ripped out by Sam Neill. And probably has terrible facial hair right now. Right, that was the film discussion bit of the show. Right, that's done. Finally. It's been a long time in uh, the making, that one. I can finally write another film review that no doubt I'll get to in like another eight weeks from now. I think you should cut that out. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm going to allow you to keep that in because I have a thing that I wanted to talk to you about and it sort of relates in that it is about terrible people. This is something that has always been on a slow burn at the back of my mind, but it's come to the forefront this week. It sounds like a good one. I've realised that I inherently distrust people who walk without moving their arms. <gasps> Yeah. Like, you know how normals walk and they like walk and they swing their arms back and forth, up and down. It doesn't have to be a lot. You don't have to go crazy with it. Well, sometimes it's fun to go crazy with it. Yeah, you don't have to look like you are the green man on the walk sign across the road. Oh, wait, you're not meant to imitate that. Um, You can if you want. It's not mandatory, I don't think. I might have broken a lot of laws, but people who walk and don't move their arms at all, I am concerned about them. There is a person that I have seen several mornings lately who walks without moving his arms at all. They're just locked by his sides and I'm 90% sure, possibly 95, that he is some kind of paedophile murderer. Is he just carrying like two heavy sacks of potatoes? No, he's not. He's carrying nothing. I wanted to clarify that I meant not someone who murders paedophiles, as in like someone who paedophiles and then murders the children. Ah, uh, yes, a paedophile murderer. Yeah. Oh, wait, I see the problem now. Uh, the paedophiling murderer? We'll go with that. And it gets to the point where I actually look at these people and I genuinely don't understand why the police aren't doing something about it. Just immediate, right, there's one, get out the taser or maybe the beanbag shotgun and just... Like, I know profiling is a bad thing, but these people are clearly maniacs who have a bucket full of not brains because that's just science yeah that's self-incriminating but a bucket of fingers just in their bedroom we'll go with fingers what are you doing with that bucket of fingers and why aren't you moving your arms when you walk are you carrying two sacks of potatoes no you're not then what's going on there unless by potatoes you mean children's body parts in which case, probably yes. I agree with you. That is a suspicious sort. I think you should plant a bug on him. I'm thinking maybe, I don't know, like typhoid or TB or something. Something that's not going to kill him, but um, maybe like polio. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have a vial of something like that somewhere in the lab. Yeah, okay, so get the vial, walk up to him, break it on his back. Don't worry, he won't do anything to stop you because he's not going to move his arms. Just break that with your bare hand with the glass, just smash against him make sure you don't cut yourself or you'll get some in there but i don't think you need to worry too much about that just like smash it onto his body yeah and then just walk away i'm trying to think through all of the possible options in my head i'm worried now that if i do that it might turn out that he is a robot Mm, and robots famously can't have diseases yeah and also that would put me in a massive dilemma because as you know robots are famously friends of science yes because there was say a war not that this is is planned in any way but if there were to be a war between magicians and scientists i do feel that the magicians would fight with robots magicians versus robots yeah i can you cut that out because i might make a graphic novel <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. magicians versus robots making all the money yeah um yeah he could be a terminator he could it's a distinct possibility just like a very early model that doesn't have functionality in his arms yet he does wear a leather jacket that he may have taken off a biker while in the nude having come back in time. I also find that there are people I don't trust, and I've just realised I give them very good reason not to trust me. What do you do? Just just punch them? No, I see a lot of people who are just ambling about the place, just ambling around the place. Like, they don't have anywhere to be, they're not out for any reason. Like, like when I'm out and about, I only go out for a reason. I have somewhere I need to go, or I am meeting someone, or there is an appointment of some kind, or I'm following someone. You need to get to the super supermarket and buy some cheese soup exactly or some raisin bran or some teeth cereal which i hear is very popular these days or a hot 
smoothie. Tell your friends. So if I'm out, you know, buying my hot smoothie or something with a side of teeth, I'm going to there. There is nothing in between. I have no time to be stopped or to interfere with anyone in the meantime, or and I certainly don't appreciate other people interfering with me. I don't want to be spoken to. So I walk with a steady determination at all times. I am much the same way. I walk in such a manner that people often stop me to ask for directions, even in towns that I have never been to before, because I walk with purpose. It gives you the false image that you know everything around you, when actually you are just a narcissist and solely consumed with yourself. But it makes it appear as though, ah, now there is a man who knows his way around things. It's like, no, you know your way around things, not anyone else's, and you cannot possibly help them because they are not you. Exactly. Are they you? If they happen to be called Phil and look like you, and uh, well, if they were you, then they'd already know where they wanted to go. So... And to be honest, if I stumbled across someone while I was walking about Basingstoke who was me... I would probably push them in an alleyway and dislocate their arms. Yeah, or fuck. Uh, no, I feel like that's something you would do. Oh yeah, that happened in that one time. With your city of theos. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a good day that was. <laughs> the thing is, right, even though I get frustrated with these ambling people who seem to just have free time, like they're not doing experiments or something, weirdos, and you know, it does bother me that people approach me thinking I just won't mind. Like, I don't have somewhere to be. I'm just out. I'm just out. Out. Out and about, out and around, can be disturbed at any point. Whilst that is frustrating, I do realise the fact that we both suffer from this problem, the fact that we are walking somewhere with determination, just looking straight ahead and only moving when someone is literally standing right in front of you. We must appear like a Terminator pursuing a child. I Like the Robert Patrick in T2, the Terminator 2 sequel edition. Judgment Day. Because in the first first one, I think you'll remember, Arnie wasn't quite in that role of, oh, I just, you know, pursue my goal no matter what, but I still come across as normal. He very much killed every single person he came across. Like, are you her? And then BAM! Yep. Dead. Immediately. In the face. Didn't even stop to properly check. Didn't even do a DNA. No, just BAM! Dead. Simple. Didn't even wait for them to answer. Just said, are you hurt? And then blam, in the face. Don't even know really why he asked. No. Poor Bill Paxton. Whereas Robert Patrick's in the second one, he was, you know, played off the role of the cop. He was determined. He was pursuing his quarry, other than when he stabbed one of those fat twins in the eye. He, for the most part, seemed to kind of manoeuvre around people. He only killed when they were directly in his way, as in there was some tactical advantage to offing someone. Everything else, he just kind of pushed through people or move around them or just kind of move with purpose. So that may be the impression that we are giving off when we're moving around town, that we are pursuing someone. I mean, often I am, but that's besides the point that, you know, we have have a Terminator-esque like goal. But at the very least we are like the advanced models. We are not the like ridiculous big massive man no clothes on, barreling through people, asking them questions and then immediately shooting them in the face before letting them answer. Yeah. Then like going in a vat of metal with a thumb up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a dead giveaway, that look. Especially when you have half your face blown off and your metal skull is exposed. That's, oh yeah, yeah, people tend to notice that. Yeah, I find that sometimes. So it may be the, the case that this person who walks with his arms down is just an older Terminator model or is attempting to give that impression. Albeit he could also be a Terminator that is pursuing a child to then pedo and then murder. It would have to be a very specific sort of programming for a Terminator to do a pedo. Yeah, it's a very specific crime, that. Not much gain in it. No. Until you can surmise. Unless... I'm not even going to go into it. There might, there may be some kind of energy transfer. <laughs> oh, God. Well, but... that is what we will refer to as the dark sciences. <laughs> uh, we won't go down that route. No, it's best not. Because even we have our limits. Uh, we're not going to look into the possibility that having sex with children may extend your life. We're not going to experiment that. Uh, we're not commissioning that study. We don't know of any studies. We don't know of any research. We don't know of anyone who 
works in that line of research. Let's just draw draw a big red line through that. Let's let's redact everything there. We have no affiliation with the dark sciences. Do you think there was maybe too strong a denial? Slightly suspicious. Okay, uh, some dark scientists are my best friends. Yeah, they're fine now. Are we ready to move on? Yeah, I think we've um, we've fuck that puppy until it's dead <laughs> yeah that was horrible phrasing but i'm sticking with it right so film pitch is this going to be a long and b interminable i really hope it won't be either but it will be i i've tried to cut it down right because i barely got through one scene uh when i tried to do this the first time and last time it just kind of peaked <laughs> off into nothing i will try not to go on and on and on or if i am at least well, yeah, I have nothing for that. It's just going to be the worst experience. <laughs> Patrick Fabian, our good friend. I thought, you know, this week, considering we're talking about science and experiments, it would be the perfect time to reignite Patrick Fabian's career with a new film that I've come up with, a completely original film for Patrick Fabian to star in. This, this film is sort of aimed at teens, teenagers, you know, maybe slightly younger, you know, was it, was it the, the, the pre... What's a tween? Uh... Is that like a guy in a big colourful outfit that like plays to kids? I might be wrong. I feel like it's some sort of rash. Okay, yeah. So people with tween, they might enjoy this as well whilst they're sick at home in bed. So Dylan Baker and John Carroll Lynch play two teenagers. <laughs> They don't have names in this film because, honestly, we don't have time for that. They have floppy teenage hair and they wear sneakers. And one of them has a brightly coloured cap on back to front. And the other has a t-shirt saying radical. They are both social outcasts because they spend all their time at home looking at Playboy and masturbating. Uh, for some reason, they live together in this, uh, and that's never explained. They're not siblings, but they only have one set of parents. And again, that's just not explained. And the parents are played by, uh, shit, uh, by Leslie Bibb and Tom Holland. So they, like, share a bedroom? Yeah, they're sort of... Do they have bunk beds, perhaps? Yeah, they've kind of got that twin hotel room thing going on. Like, two single beds? Yeah, and it's just in one room. Yeah, the most awkward combination of beds there has ever been. <laughs> yeah, but it's fine because they just sit on their beds uh, looking at all the Playboy and just masturbating. And that's fine. Is that all right if they're doing it at the same time? They're looking away from each other, and, but they do chat a little bit. Oh, they're doing it back to back. <laughs> It's fine, okay? It's fine. I think at, th okay. Okay, at this point... If we get bogged down in all of this, then this will take forever. So we'll just take it as read that two teenage boys <laughs> played by John Carroll Lynch and Dylan Baker yeah. sitting in a room back-to-back -back looking at Playboy <laughs> and furiously masturbating. Even though and they're not brothers, but they live together, but they're, like, 15. <laughs> and they only have one set of parents. Yeah, that's all fine. Yeah. We'll just take that as read that that is fine. Yeah, yeah I'm going to flash it from the screen. This is fine. <laughs> so, right. Anyway, they are sad because they don't have girlfriends. And John Carroll Lynch is all like, Oh, I don't like this, eh? Up, I don't like this one bit. We are sad and pathetic. Is he from Yorkshire? Who knows? Okay. Dylan Baker is all like, Oh, I know. We just sit here masturbating to Playboy and we don't have girlfriends. That's an alarmingly good impression of Dylan Baker. <laughs> Some of these are good. <laughs> oh, I know. Why don't you make one of those using that computer of yours have all the big bangers and all? Oh, what? Like, make two girlfriends? Like, so we don't have to share? No, just the one will do. Don't forget the big bangers. And so they do it. They just make a girlfriend using a blueprint of um, Leslie Bibb. I mean, it's it's sounding familiar nope. at the moment. I'm just going to say that. No, 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 no. This is the original idea. They just, they do do, they've got like some science around like us you know we experiment with things you know they've got like some beakers and they've got a computer they've got like a laptop and they just like plug the laptop into a phone and and that works and then they use a blueprint of leslie bibb that they have lying around and then they just make a girlfriend okay is it not suspicious that they have a blueprint of leslie bibb just lying around and isn't leslie bibb like their mum <laughs> Or one of them. Shit, <laughs> I forgot about that. Okay, all right, it's Taylor Swift. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, whatever. And, you know, what, don't you have a blueprint of Taylor Swift just lying around? 
I don't mean a photo, I mean a blueprint. <laughs> but anyway, whatever. They're, okay, and they're just like putting porn in the laptop because, I don't know, like, it's all fine. Anyway, no, it's not fine. It all goes wrong. <laughs> Because uh, instead of a girlfriend, it is Patrick Fabian. Yay! Here he is. Out of the capsule or whatever, with the myths, he just steps out. Like out of the 3D printer. They've essentially 3D printed a living Patrick Fabian. Exactly. Uh, and he's not a girlfriend. And he makes a gun motion with his hand and winks and say, hey, kids. And they find this very disturbing. Yeah, I, I find that disturbing as well. <laughs> yeah, and they were like, you don't look like a girlfriend. Oh, no, it's all gone wrong. And then Patrick Fabian is like, oh, so it's girlfriends you want. Well, you came to the right place. Come on. And they all leave the place they're in. Oh, God, he's a pimp. It's They've 3D printed a pimp. Hmm. That could be the title of the film. Anyway, <laughs> but no, it's all fine. You see, it's all fine. It's not, oh God, it's fine. Is that the subtitle of the film? Yeah, this is fine. It's all fine. Because <laughs> uh, there'll be a funny bit where they're all in the shower together. And it'll be funny because there's soap like all over the place. And nudity is inherently funny. So, and there'll be like a loafer, which is hilarious. <laughs> Showers are funny. Right, okay, so we'll have the shower scene. Okay, and that's all fine. <laughs> and then <laughs> Patrick Fabian takes the two young boys out on the town to make them more attractive to women. Is it fine, though? It's, it's fine. It's all fine. So they go to... Um, Oh, uh, what are what are those things called that they have at cemeteries? They're like above ground tombs. Mausoleums. Mausoleums. That's it. So uh, Dylan Baker and John Carroll Lynch, <laughs> I keep forgetting it's those two, uh, enter a mausoleum, and Patrick Fabian is already in there. He ran on ahead. Come on, boys! And so Patrick is just in there, and he's crowbarring open all the coffins, and there's dust all over the place. And Patrick Fabian is all like, "Ha! Huh? What about this one? She's a real beaut." Uh, and he gestures at like a very skeletal looking cadaver and uh, the boys are like uh, uh, she's not really my type and John Carroll Lynch is all like, I'm not so sure I like the look of that one. Really? And he breaks off a finger with like a dry crack and pops it in his mouth and chews. Seems fine to me. Well, actually, I was hoping we could find some women who are a bit more alive. Oh. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, what you kids must think of me right now. I thought you meant... Never mind. I know what you boys want. And so that's fine. If there's one thing that I've always said is missing from modern cinema, it's just a healthy dose of cheeky necrophilia. <laughs> exactly. And so that's As long fine. as it's all fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's all fine. And so after that, Patrick Fabian helps himself to a few more fingers. And then they go to the mall to pick out some real women, right? <laughs> so they're at the mall. And it's one of those huge like American malls that we totally don't have over here. It's all like nice and there's a fountain and it's all luxurious and it's totally not a cesspit of base consumerism. And we sort of see Patrick Fabian in the background just like running around and causing trouble and hijinks and like occasionally we'll see him like run in a direction with a lasso and then chasing some young girl and laughing. Again, it's all fine. And the two teens, Dylan Baker and John Carroll Lynch, they're just sat by the fountain in the mall and they just have like a quick masturbate at Playboy and they chat. And then Patrick Fabian strolls on with two good looking teen gals. Look what I got! Two teens of equivalent age! And they are played by Melissa Joan Hart and Amy Yazbek. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's all fine. Remember Melissa Joan Hart? Oh, oh wasn't she nice? Yeah, oh. She was a witch and also told it all. Yeah, she did tell it all. And then there's Amy Yazbek. I don't know who that is. Uh, she was the redhead uh, Peggy Brandt in the Mask film. Oh, Oh, yeah, I remember her. Yeah, she's not really a thing anymore. Did you put her in because we talked about the mask for literally about 40 minutes, one of the last podcasts? I have no memory of that, but that does explain why I watched the mask the <laughs> other day. <laughs> Am I planting ideas in your head? <laughs> I think, yeah, oh, I tell you we shouldn't drink whilst we do this. <laughs> anyway, so then the two young girls, Miss Joan Hart and Amy Asbeck, they were like, Oh, you look nice. Oh, come here and give us a kiss. Somehow they're voiced by Terry Jones from Monty Python. <laughs> Again, that's fine. But then calamity strikes. A wrench is thrown into the mix because Mark Strong and Sean Pertwee, the two evil teens are there. Oh, 
fuck. And they're bad news. How evil are we talking? Oh, they've got uh, gel in their hair. Do they have those jackets that all teens, like the cool teens in films wear, but we don't have at all over in this country? Varsity jackets. Yeah, yeah. they each have them on, but they each have the other person's name on the back. That is That makes perfect sense. Yeah, and they laugh at things, and one of them has like a toothpick, and one of them has like, it looks like a flick knife, but it's just a comb. Oh, uh, yeah. It's like a flick comb, but it's threatening. He, he like he, he kind of threatens someone. He like flicks it. Ah! And you're like, oh shit! Oh oh no, it's a comb. Um, and they have a car, and it's their car. Again, they co-own it somehow, and somehow they can afford a convertible or a muscle car. Yeah, because they have rich dads. Yeah, and they're like fifteen, so that that makes them evil. And did I mention they got gel in their hair? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was immediately turned off by the gel in their hair. I was like, these. F- Fuckers have got to be evil. Yeah, and one of them has like a chest repulsor. Like Iron Man. Yeah. Okay. So what a dick. That That's all fine. Yeah, oh, we don't like them. No. So just when our heroes are about to get laid, from a balcony above them, Mark Strong dumps an entire McFlurry on the pair of them. And I mean, it's a huge, like, imagine a KFC bucket of chicken, like, as in, you know, the biggest one they do. Imagine that just filled with McFlurry. Chicken McFlurry. Chicken McFlurry from... From KFC and it hits them both with like a wet splat and they get covered in it. Well, that's good because that's product placement. So that's like half our budget right there. Brilliant. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Come down to KFC and get ye a bucket of McFlurry. Bucket of chicken McFlurry. <laughs> anyway, so um, this is Joan Hart and Amy Yazbek. Uh, they're completely put off by this. They're no longer up for it. They were, you know, they're all hot and steamy beforehand, but now they just run back to their boyfriends, which is Mark Strong and Sean Pertwee. And all four of them just have full on sex on the ground like right there and then i'm concerned about you about the amount of scenarios that you concoct in your head that involve sean pertwee having sex with like a teenage girl <laughs> oh no it's fine it's all fine uh because it's amy yasbeck in this so oh, okay but like is it full penetrative sex see everything yeah yeah i mean we'll do because the- even though so, like i'd be worried about how much you want to see sean pertwee doing penetrative <laughs> sex <laughs> yeah i mean we'll do it tastefully like in the Lars von Trier film where it's not the actor you don't see his penis going we get like a porn star so we cut back and forth yeah and that's all fine right did i mention that it's fine because it is you haven't mentioned that I was wondering whether it was all fine. So then as they're going away at it, Patrick Fabian just comes up behind the two of them as they're plowing these two young girls. And he like punches them in the back with his fingers and like grabs hold of their spinal cords and then just pulls out their spines. And they're like, oh, what? You have to go and do that bloody for you bastard. Oh, this is just, oh, this is no good. So that that's, that's them told. Does the sex continue once they have had their spines removed? Not really. They kind of finish like uh, uh, and then it's over and then Melissa Joan Hart and Amy Asbeck sort of get up they dust themselves up and they're like you know they've got blood load and spinal fluid and stuff and they're like oh you're just not the man I thought you were and then they leave for some reason they only speak with one voice I don't understand that either there's a lot of duos in this film that um have only really characterized roles for both of them to fulfill at the same time but anyway that's all fine it's all fine and then Patrick Fabian just stands there as he's holding like he, he like he hasn't pulled the entire a spinal column out of each team. Uh, he sort of snapped it in half and bust out the bottom bit. So it's like broken. Yeah. So then they're all, they're fucked. So it sort of looks like they have a tail, like a prehensile bone tail. Yeah, and it looks really stupid. Everyone's just laughing at them going, a bone tail. Yeah, and they can't properly walk. Mark Strong's chest repulsor is sort of stopped working. They're like sort of writhing on the ground a bit. They're like, oh, this is no good. I don't like this one bit no 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 but important question yeah you know like they're sort of writhing around bit of their spine pulled out Mm. everyone laughing at them Mm. they're in horrible pain yeah is it all fine well they do have their trousers down you do see their dingle dangles oh well that's fine Sorry, I retract my question. And at that point, that's when our heroes, you know, they see this and they're in a convertible for some reason and that's theirs and they're with Patrick Fabian now. Unfortunately, those two girls have just left but Patrick Fabian is there. He's got all the spinal blood on either hand and he just turns as he walks over to the convertible. He says, oh, and remember, there's a party at Dylan Baker's and John Carroll Lynch's tonight. And then they drive off. 
and roll credits. Yeah, that is pretty much the end. I enjoyed it. I think out of all of the film pitches that you've done, I fell asleep during that one for the shortest period of time. So oh, that's good. That is an improvement. That may be a mark of improving quality. Although I will say that there were elements of the film that were very close to a weird porn version of the movie Weird Science. Ah. I've never heard of that film before. Oh, well, that's all fine. <laughs> yeah, it's all fine. I have a feeling there may be more to the story, but that's the point at which I stopped watching a film that's not called Weird Science. I sort of got up to a similar bit in a similar in a not similar film and then didn't want to watch any more of it and thought that'll do. Maybe we'll have some stuff in the credits. We'll do like a pre, mid and post credits sequence of just like mayhem going on at the house. Maybe Leslie Bibb and Tom Holland will get frozen for some reason maybe some bikers will show up maybe bill paxton will get turned into a pile of manure and he'll just go up the chimney and that'll be funny for the kids yeah oh when we'll play that sexy saxophone song oh yeah the george michael one. Oh, sexy one. careless whisper yeah, yeah yeah we'll just play that on loop for about 20 minutes you know when a film ends when they rap but they just keep filming and just see how long they'll stay in character for well we'll have dylan baker and john carroll lynch awkwardly dancing in the center of the room and those two girls that they were into, a Mr. Joan Hart and Amy Asbeck, they're sort of dancing awkwardly in the background. And then Patrick Fabian is just sort of like running around and like dragging on Mark Strong and Sean Pert, where you're still like, oh, you bloody bollocks, I hate this. Then they get like run over by a biker or something. And then Bill Paxton is there and he's all manure. And he's, he's got arms somehow. He's like, oh, manure. And then some weird things happen, like someone explodes and there's a dog on the ceiling and, and everything turns upside down and the, and the sky eye turns green for a bit and the top of the house just blows off and then Patrick Fabian goes off and in a post credit sequence we see him teaching volleyball to a class of school children. Sorry I wasn't listening but I mean that all sounded fine. Yeah, I think it's fine right because uh, he walks into the classroom and sort of says so boys you want to learn how to handle balls and then they all come immediately well maybe and then oh yeah and then that can all like run down and, and form a puddle and then Patrick Fabian can like slip in it. Yeah yeah, because that's funny it is funny. Patrick Fabian slip in the ejaculate of teenage boys is possibly the funniest thing ever. It's pretty funny. Comedy genius. That is a film. I don't have a title for it. The working title was Weird Science 2, colon Weirder Science, or Science Just Got Weirder. You know, I will admit there are similarities with the 1980s film Weird Science starring Anthony Michael Hall and others and uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Bill Paxton who is in your version as well weirdly uh yeah, but this is modern day Bill Paxton. Oh, like weird, like balding, yeah. sort of flabby Bill Paxton. Yeah, sort of like he's quite tall, but his skin is kind of flabby. You know, he's kind of, kind of not, not looking so so good, but still playing those kinds of roles. Still, it's very weird and disconcerting. Yeah. Uh, he does have hair that is completely flat, but cut very short, very long comparatively at the sides. So you can get a nice flat top that's maybe at best like a millimeter above the peak of his head. I like it. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, but he is Mignot, so yeah. that's funny. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I came up with a title. Brilliant. Is it is it Bad Science? No, I went for a sort of 1980s straight to VHS B-movie kind of title. I can't wait. I would like it to be called 3D Printed Necro Pimp, colon, <laughs> It's All Fine. <laughs> Initially, I did just write 3D printed pimp, but then there was that whole bit in the mausoleum, so I put necro in there. But that was fine. So It was fine. So yeah. I put in colon, it's all fine. <laughs> is that is that your film pitch done? Yeah, I have noticed that my film pitches tend to peter out quite a lot towards <laughs> the end. I come in strong, like really hard with my Dylan Bakers and what have you. Yeah. But then I sort of kind of get scared and lost. <laughs> yeah. I also don't entirely know what role Patrick Fabian fulfills in most of these plots he just seems to be involved mm. in some fashion yeah like indiana jones in the first indiana jones films he's just there in fact in all of them he's just there yeah uh, patrick, patrick fabian, fabian. <laughs> he's just there <laughs> 
I have nothing good to finish on. You just do that thing that you do where it literally just peters out and then it just ends. I like the podcast where they just end. Yeah. It makes sense we're now going to end on an ad read. That'll be the new thing. But it is quite good where it just ends and then people have to like check their player like, oh, oh, oh did yeah. it cut out? Oh, oh, no. Oh, no, it ended. Oh, no, it is. They're just done yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm going to have to do this good. Yeah, you've got to match up to Uncle Jimmy's homemade intercontinental ballistic missile. You got the, what it, what, the cadence correct. I need to get into the right mind. So. <clears throat> this episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the simplest way for anyone to create a beautiful and functional underground post-apocalypse survival bunker. Squarespace puts your survival needs into your own hands by providing an expansive range of professional and impenetrable fortifications that will ensure your continued existence in safety and relative comfort after the coming cataclysm. Long-time listeners will be well aware that my my co-host once attempted to build his own fallout shelter to no success. Rather than having to tunnel through sewage line after sewage line, you can avoid all that hassle by simply signing up with Squarespace and get started building your own anti-Armageddon sanctuary today. No construction or biochemistry skills are necessary. Go to squarespace.com and enter the code I hope we can't get sued for this at checkout and get 10% off your water purification sachets. Thanks to Squarespace for their support of this show. Oh, wait! Shit, that advert was meant to be for Preppers Got You Sorted, No Worries Mate dot com. Oh, well, we both got mixed up on our ad reads this week. Oh, who'd have thought uh, it? Oh, it's so difficult. We've got all these oh, sponsors, and I... I write the names down wrong. Oh, well. We have so many sponsors, like, the pages in my notebook got stuck together, I think. From all the semen. Yeah. Not mine. No. It was the hamsters. <laughs> I'm glad you said the hamster and not all the preteen boys, because that was... No. That's Patrick Fabian's stick. It may have been semen. I may have just dropped it in the brain bucket. Does this still count as an advert for Squarespace? I think in an advert for Squarespace, it's perfectly fine to say, bucket of preteens. <laughs> <laughs> Squarespace.com. Use the offer code Bucket of Preteens. <laughs> that is not going to be the episode title. <laughs> we definitely won't get on iTunes with that. <laughs> I just realised as well in the film pitch it wasn't preteens. <laughs> oh, it's worse in a way. <laughs> oh. oh, Jesus. Okay. Fuck. Uh, well, I'll have cut it off at some point by now.